Kia ora koutou, uh, me karakia tātou. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki te, kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi a ki ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, te hei mauri ora. Tēnā tātou katoa, no mai hari mai ki tēnei hui ata. Welcome to our webinar this morning. Welcome to around about 300 of you who've registered to come along and learn about trans health and patient-centered care um, from across the country. Um, welcome to those of you who came along on Tuesday to hear us talking about intersex health with our friend Jelly from Intersex Aotearoa. You can go back and watch that recording if you didn't manage to make it along on Tuesday. But um, Welcome to those of you here today live and those of you watching the recording later. Um, wonderful to have all of you here with us to learn about this. Um, just introducing our topic for this webinar, I'll jump straight into it and then introduce um, Joey who'll be sharing some of the, the content. This is the last of three webinars that we've had in this series. The previous two were about um, intersex health, um, both the one we had on Tuesday, which was sort of for a general audience of anyone working in healthcare. And we had one um, towards the end of last year, which was specifically for medical students. So for people studying towards roles in healthcare, those recordings are both up on our website if you'd like to check them out at some stage. And we'd really like to thank um, both the Council of Medical Colleges and the New Zealand Medical Students Association for their engagement with us, for working with us um, on this series and helping to promote out to their um, to their membership and their audiences. Really look forward to future opportunities to work together with them and with, um, with some of you hopefully on the, on the call today. So today we are gonna be having a conversation about current tensions and hot topics in trans health, transgender health. We'll talk about informed consent, about the need for respect, privacy and self-determination about how to put those sorts of concepts um, and principles into practice with your interactions with trans people, wherever you work across the medical system. Um, and then we'll be talking a little bit too about the bigger picture of how we can work together to improve healthcare for all of us. We'll start with some framing about gender affirming care and informed consent, and then move into the kind of, yeah, putting it into practice um, mode and think about um, Zooming out to think about public health, um, the role of community organisations as part of the wider health system. So um, today, none of us are clinicians. Um, those of us who are speaking today, we're talking from a community organisational perspective, not a clinical perspective. But we do work with medical professionals and healthcare systems a lot. Um, we want you to know that you have a role to play in the transformation of our health system so that it better meets the needs of trans and intersex people, whatever role it is that you have within healthcare, um, you have a, a sphere of influence that you can work within, um, you have something that you can do. We want um, trans and intersex led organizations to play a leadership role in collaboration with healthcare providers to transform the health system. So part of what we're talking about is the role of community led organizations. Um, and just to also say, I guess, that this isn't so much a trans 101 workshop. We're not going to be getting into kind of definitions and language about what transgender means, that kind of thing. If you want that, we can point you in the right direction. There are lots of resources online um, that we'll be sharing with you. Before we get into it further, let's just int introduce ourselves a bit more and what kind of experience we have working in this space. Maybe I'll go first because I'm still off mute. Um, but ko Moira Clooney, toko ingwa, I'm Moira. I am the project lead at Tingaka Kahukura. So a lot of our work around gender affirming healthcare is at a systems level. It's not working with individual clients, but it's um, a lot of advocacy and education around trying to um, help health systems work better, try and get these services funded, try and um, help healthcare providers understand their role and what they can do. Um, as I said, I'm not a clinician. I have a bit of a public health angle, so I um, have worked in mental health and suicide prevention, and um, my master's was kind of half around public health, um, also with thinking about community leadership. So I'm interested in that intersection of, of public health and community development and um, how we can involve kind of community voices and lived experience and um, within healthcare 
um, I also do some work at a sort of advisory um, and advocacy level with government around healthcare systems. And uh, chair of the board, co-chair of the board of Outline Aotearoa, which provides um, mental health support to rainbow people across Aotearoa. So involved at that sort of service planning level um, in terms of mental health counselling and psychosocial support. So those are a few hats um, that I wear, I guess, in terms of trans health. Um, and I've probably spoken enough for the time being. I might just pass <laughs> over to my colleague, Joey. Joey uh, will be talking with us today. Can you say a bit more about who you are and why yes. you're interested in this? Kia ora koutou. Thanks, ora. Moira. Um, so I'm Joey McDonald. I'm the education lead for Tingako Kahukura, and I've been working in trans health or trans, queer, et cetera, community development and mental health spaces, uh, I don't know, for the last 10, 15 years and doing quite a lot of liaising and collaborating is often what I feel like my role is, um, you know, trying to figure out how we can have better systems and make committees and move things forward. I won't go into a whole heap about about that because it is going to be coming up in the presentation again but um, Moira and I are both based in Tamaki Makoto. I'm out west there in central. Um, west Auckland's also where I grew up and I'm a Pākehā person with uh, Scottish and English ancestry mostly. We've also got Jono in the chat as our um, colleague which is always very helpful so please I notice there's a lot of people introducing themselves in the chat. Um, that's always nice to see. We always like to know who's here. We like to know where you are. We like to know what your work is. Um, and, and questions and comments that you put in there, we will definitely take note of. So yeah, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I didn't put that in my little name thing, which is a pretty basic error on my part. But yeah, that's probably enough um, background, right? Because we've got quite a lot that we want to get through. Yeah, kia ora. Thanks, Joey. Um, as I was saying, yeah, feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself, to ask questions or make comments as we're, as we're talking. We'll make some specific space at the end of Joey's presentation to, um, to answer questions, but um, this is a conversational type of presentation, so we'd love to hear from you. Um, as we go along, we'd love to know about whether what we're sharing is useful to you and what questions and reflections that you have. And yeah, please do feel free to introduce yourself. Let us know more about um, where you're from, what kind of role you have within healthcare. You can also ask questions in the Q&A area. There's an option for you to do that if you want, and that lets you ask questions anonymously if you'd prefer to. Um, we might not necessarily get to all the questions that we have, but we appreciate all of you and welcome any, yeah, any thoughts or questions that you have. Please be mindful that this is being recorded. It'll be publicly available later. And part of what that means is if, um, if we're taking your questions and asking each other, we might end up kind of reframing to um, broaden the question out or to make sure that we're not um, sharing identifiable information of any individual, that kind of thing. And just with that in mind too, just um, you might be thinking about individuals that you work with um, as questions come up for you, but please don't be sharing any information about specific people. Um, privacy, privacy and confidentiality are super important, of, of course, across any area of healthcare, but especially in this space, which will um, We'll speak to a little bit later. So that's some of the housekeeping. Um, I hand over back to you, Joey, to get into yeah, the presentation. Yeah, awesome. Kia ora. And we've got more people joining all the time, which is really exciting. We've broken this presentation into three parts um, because a topic like trans health, when we approach it that broadly, there's so many different things that we could cover. And we've tried to do a kind of interesting mix of things to try and meet the needs of our quite varied audience. That means that I'm going to talk for a few minutes about um, part one, what does gender affirming care mean? What's the model of informed consent? Some of you will be very familiar with this already. Other people, it will be completely new. Then we're going to stop and do a kind of discussion between Moira and myself. If any questions have come up that we want to pull out from the chat, we'll be trying to do that. It'll be only a short little question time for like five minutes, and then we'll jump back into part two. And as Moira said earlier, part two is really about putting it into practice. And that is relevant to not just people working in gender affirming care delivery services, but uh, more broadly than that as well. 
and then the last the last piece we'll have another break we'll have a discussion the last piece will be how we can all be working together to transform the health system and how necessary that is all right what do we mean by gender affirming care what's an informed consent approach the next slide answers these questions we notice there are people who are sometimes getting confused about saying I need to be gender affirming in healthcare or what is gender affirming healthcare, right? But we're actually talking about two different areas of health there and obviously they overlap. We're trying to say that there are services that are providing gender affirming care. Those services are in primary and secondary services. That's not limited to just specialist services. And we're also saying that people across the health system and, and where, whatever your role is in that healthcare provision system can provide trans inclusive or affirming of gender healthcare. Those are different things. We've got some notes here about what kind of things might be included in gender affirming care. There's a lot more links that we're providing you at the end if you want more details about that. At Tengako Kahukura, we have some uh, principles that we want to advocate for in terms of how gender affirming healthcare is delivered in New Zealand, and we've listed these in, uh, in the following slides. I also know that we've put a lot of words in these slides, and we're still going to be trying to get through them really fast. Don't worry. All of these slides are totally available to you afterwards. So we've written this kind of as a resource rather than as a really high level kind of slide deck. It's really going to be um, something you can come back to, something you can reread. If any of these words don't make sense to you or um, you want more detail about it, you can get in touch with us. Uh, we've got a, a way to do that through the website. We've got a way to do that. Oh, I'm just going to. Oh, no, yep. we've got Jelly joined us, by the way, Moira, I just noticed. So we we have all of these principles that we're trying to encourage people to work from. Te whare tapafa is really important as a, as a framework that we want gender affirming healthcare as well as all healthcare to be delivered in relation to. People here will be familiar with that. We're not going to, again, go into huge amounts of detail about it. But those last two points, at Tengako Kahukura, we really feel that they are important in terms of how things get developed. So how policy gets written, how services get delivered, how we design services. We want that to be designed and led by trans communities. And by that, we mean trans groups and organizations, people who are um, bringing that community expertise to the table. We're going to talk more about that at the end. And we also think, as we said in the, in the webinar on Tuesday this week, that it's extremely important for us to be doing that in solidarity with intersex people and advocates, with people of variations of sex characteristics. There are a lot of shared issues, and we have previous webinars about that topic too, to do with bodily autonomy and trans and intersex people. Cool. More of a quote from TransHub, that's an Australian um, resource that I would really recommend you go and check out. What does informed consent mean in trans health? That's a more specific thing than it, you know, it has informed consent is something that people who work in healthcare know about broadly. In terms of gender affirming care and trans health, it gets used in a particular way that is about recognizing the self-determination of the person in front of you and not automatically re requiring a mental health assessment, not seeing this as something that is a pathology, not needing to diagnose somebody, um, removing some of that gatekeeping and doing an approach that's much more about responding to the person in front of you, which is why I think it meshes really well with patient-centered care. This is the key point, I think, about why, why people are advocating so strongly for an informed consent approach in gender affirming care. It's because it's very important for us to have access to mental health support if we want that, if, if that's something that we need, which I would argue a lot of people need, whether you're trans or cis or whatever. But if you require a mental health assessment or a readiness assessment or something where you have to go to a mental health professional, especially if that's a psychiatrist, and get a letter or kind of cross off those particular diagnostic criteria, that's a huge barrier for a lot of people. And it's not actually necessary. We have, especially in the provision of hormone therapy in New Zealand, we have guidelines that have recently been produced that are in the resources section of this webinar, suggesting that primary care providers can uh, use an informed consent approach and not require a mental health assessment when they're providing hormones to trans people. 
this is a quote from an excellent article that I would also recommend that you go and read. Clinicians do and should have these kind of conversations with their patients all the time. That's part of what we're saying with an informed consent approach to gender affirming care, is it's not uncommon to be providing hormone therapy to your cisgender patients in primary care. We need that to be the same for transgender patients. That's a kind of health access equity we're looking for. These are some resources and we will, again, all of these are available for you. Highly recommend GMA's resources, highly recommend that article and the, and the guidelines. Anyone working in primary care needs to read those guidelines. Thanks, Moira. Okay. Okay, lost my cursor briefly, um, but I'm back. Um, thank you so much, Joey. So that's part, part one, um, how we're structuring this is having a little bit of a chat in between sections. Mm. Um, and do feel free to um, add your questions and comments into the chat or the Q&A, um, as we were saying. But we'll ad address those mostly at the end. Um, but just to, um, just to think about section one, um, without kind of getting into the whole history of um, <laughs> trans healthcare, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about why a mental health assessment would be required? Like what was, what's, mm. the, what's the thinking there? It's hard to put that in a really succinct way, but yeah. um, obviously, and yes, somebody asked, can, I, can we email the PowerPoint out? The PowerPoint will be available for you on our website. So you can just go there and download it anytime. Um, and we'll send you some stuff after this as well. The history of um, pathologizing gender diversity or variations of how people do their gender. That's like the Western medical model, right? Sees uh, a way of doing gender as being normal and it's a kind of white Western binary approach to gender. And that got enshrined in something like the DSM and various other medical um, institutional knowledge thingies. Um, and then it got applied to people in contexts like here where it's often deeply inappropriate. So I think there's a strong history of trans people um, trying to advocate, trying to be honest, trying to be more clear with their clinicians and providers and trying to say, hey, that criteria doesn't work for me, that doesn't fit for me. Um, being trans is not a problem I have. I'm not broken because of this. I don't need fixing. What I need is access to healthcare or access to something to help me live my life. Um, it's trying to put it into that realm of access to healthcare rather than something that you have to be diagnosed as having gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria as it is now, or kind of, yeah, which goes a long way towards um, thinking about cultural safety and cultural competence too in this context. But that's a whole nother thing as well. Absolutely, thank you. Shall we, shall we move to the second section and then we will be talking about what this actually means in practice because it's all very well and good to have these highfalutin principles. Next one. And I see people in the chat saying that uh, some people don't know that informed consent is even a possible model for gender affirming care and trans health. And that's so true. We would encourage you to share this webinar or any other resources that we've shared with you to anyone who needs them. This is why we make publicly available resources. <laughs> I see Jono's in the chat saying the same thing. Three key points that we're gonna break down in a bit more detail about what this means for your interactions with people as a healthcare provider. Demonstrate respect, protect my privacy and support self-determination. What does that actually mean? Well, the first section, <laughs> thank you. Yes, this, this is not a surprise to anyone. Name and pronouns, that's become kind of a basic thing for people to talk about. I want to encourage us to think about the context in which we're asking people about their names and pronouns. Please be mindful, this is not something to be asking about in a crowded waiting room or with somebody else in front of you. Um, you know, with a, with a kind of many people who might hear the situation or even be aware that people might give you a different response with a family member in the room versus not having a family member in the room. Just, just keep that in mind. It's not always completely uh, as simple as you might want it to be. And really one of the key things here is that you need to be adaptable. So in terms of language, 
it's not about not making any assumptions because you automatically will make assumptions. You will bring your bias. You will bring whatever cultural lens you have. Um, but there will be ways in which you can adapt to the, the information that someone is sharing with you and the, the approach that they seem to want to have and bridge between maybe those different perspectives that you have. Organ inventories, this is going to be such a good topic to talk about next week because I don't have time this week, but we've got Cassie coming in to talk about patient management software and organ inventories will be part of that discussion. I will also provide a little link to some resources about that. That's about shifting language away from saying um, women's health screening, if you're actually saying cervical screening, or it's about, you know how you have a tick box that says male and female perhaps or you might have male female gender diverse and then that relates to automatic screening that people get particularly in primary care how can we move to a more accurate um, system right where you and you're saying do you have a cervix would cervical screening be relevant to you do you have a prostate can we screen for prostate cancer being more specific is relevant to to trans and non-binary people it's relevant to a lot of people so it helps us not make the assumptions we might make about reproduction and sex characteristics. So it's relevant to intersex people too. We'll talk more about that next week. Please come along. These are all more practice tips about being honest, being transparent, um, being clear, being able to make mistakes. It's okay. If you work in healthcare, you're allowed to make mistakes. <laughs> I think everyone needs to be able to make mistakes. How else are you going to learn? It's about how you recover from those mistakes. People will remember the moment where you corrected yourself. They will remember the moment where you said, oh, sorry, my bad. She's here to talk about blah, 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 blah. You know, when you've used the right pronoun for someone after using the wrong one or when you've said, hey, I know this is really problematic um, that I have to fill out this form and it's only got these options, but what would you like me to tick here? Like, we know that you're not a, a representative of the system, uh, that you want the system to be improved too. So please just be, be transparent about that. And the next section is about protecting privacy. The most important thing here is recognizing the difference between privacy and secrecy. This is something I've really learned in relation to intersex healthcare and the times that Jelly has been talking about, um, the difference between moving from a concealment model and the, the kind of assumption that, you know, you should not talk about being intersex or you should not talk about being trans. Um, that's something that is shameful and worrying and you should sort of, you know, become normal or pretend to be normal or receive healthcare interventions to make you normal. It's all part of that. Um, pathologizing kind of framework and we're trying to shift that move away from that which means I think embracing privacy and dignity um, thinking about how the medical system is invested in normalcy but actually how humans are never really normal right that's not what human bodies are like that's not what personhood is like yeah we'll talk more about um, about all these things next week as well Another aspect of healthcare, which most people here are probably very familiar with, is to do with confidentiality. Don't out us without talking to us about who you're going to talk about us with. Um, and if you are working in a multidisciplinary team or a team of people where people are going to have access to our notes and you're writing things in the notes that are relevant to that, um, please just tell us, you know, be clear, be transparent about that. Prioritize our privacy. Yeah. No, it's all good. We can move on. I think power dynamics are an impossible topic to fully address. Here are some key tips. Um, I say don't expect us to educate you automatically, and it's that word automatically that's important there. Of course, we all learn together. Of course, you know, we are all part of informing each other's expertise. Some, some people will be very willing to educate you either about themselves or about the broader context of what it means to be trans or the broader context of what the pathways of care are. As, as a patient, they may have really upskilled themselves about that. I do want you to take that seriously when that happens, but don't expect it of us because it's really not our jobs. Um, it's often what we end up having to do because the healthcare system is not providing enough support and education to the practitioners, to the people working in that system. That's partly why we do webinars like this. I think being aware of power dynamics is the most important thing there. Collaborate, navigate the system with us. Again, this comes back to us not wanting to 
uh, pretend that the system works better than it does. We actually know that that you are human too, as clinicians, as healthcare workers. We don't need you to pretend it's perfect. We need you to be clear with us when it's not perfect. Hmm. Be open-minded about what, what we might want is another important point. Refrain from narrowing the scope of possibility or widen the scope of possibilities. I, I think that's so, so important and something that I think is quite a big ask. Um, that requires you to do quite a lot of self-awareness and self-reflection work, requires you to really think about what you think is possible in terms of embodiment, in terms of life, in terms of gender, sex, sexuality, all these things. It re requires you to be very aware of your own cultural lens. You can find lots of opportunities like this and other links that we're providing with you to upskill yourself. And I think, um, community organizations do a huge amount of sharing our expertise and our knowledge with the goal that you will widen the scope of possibilities for us, with us, when we're in front of you in a healthcare setting. So there's a lot out there that you can learn from. Here's some more resources. That's the end of section two. Thanks, Joy. lots to consider. Um, I think one thing that stood out to me was this idea of um, asking that people keep reflecting on their own experiences of gender on their own sort of lens about these things. Um, why is that important? I think because that's cultural safety, right? So it's like any other aspect of cultural safety. We've moved beyond the idea that you're going to learn learn about what are the three things that trans people want you to say, or what are the 10 things that if you do the secret handshake and make this kind of eye contact, everyone will feel safe and comfortable. It's not like that. It's much more like you are your own person as part of providing a healthcare service. And if you are aware of what you're bringing and what, what the suffering might be for you, that's not, it's not, a, it's not an easy thing. You know, that's not a small ask. It's harder, I think, to do that self-reflection than it is to go and like read technical information, especially if you've been trained in a healthcare profession. You've you've learned how to learn things. You've learned how to learn things, especially in a more intellectual way, but you haven't necessarily been encouraged to do self-reflection on your practice. I mean, obviously some people have and do, but I think that particular um, skill is one that we could all benefit from a lot more. Mm, it helps because mm. you're thinking about what am I bringing, you know, and some of the things that I will bring to this interaction, it might be that I think it would be a terrible problem for X, Y, Z position for someone to be in socially or for their body to be like this thing is very hard for me to understand. But actually, if that's what this person is saying that they need or want, refraining from judgment about that is helpful. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking too that um, as medical professionals, you're often learning, when you're learning, you're often learning to be the expert as well, right? And I guess this is one space where mm. um, you you might know some things, you might learn some things, but it really, um, best practice is really like working with the person in front of you, understanding what, what they want out of their healthcare. Mm. Be the expert to... on the system. Mm. Or be... The... be... You go. And be the, I was going to say be the expert at listening as well. Yeah, listening yeah. and pathways, like what's what's possible. It's really good if within the practical realm of what you can refer people to and how to get there, that's all stuff that we really need health professionals and people working in health to know about. But you don't need to be an expert on my gender. You don't need to be an expert on my body. That's not That's not your job. If you can hold mm -hmm. a safe space for me to give you that information and, and hear what I'm saying, that's probably going to go a lot a lot further yeah yeah thank you um and i can see we've had some questions mm. coming through which is really wonderful keep those coming um in the chat or in the q a and we'll get to them at the end but are you feeling ready to go on to section three joey yes oh so this is zooming back out thinking about ways we can transform the health system and my call to action is about how that needs all of us to be doing that work I've 
been working a lot with um, organizations and associations like PATHA, the Professional Association for Transgender Health Aotearoa, since its inception. And this, this, these slides really come out of that learning that I think people who have clinical expertise and specialist knowledge about, as a healthcare provider haven't necessarily had the time in their life and in their day to go around learning about the other kinds of expertise that we all might be bringing, that community advocates might be bringing. So I've tried to spell out what some of the um, concepts and ways of thinking about this could look like so that we can actually value each other's expertise. That's why I'm making this distinction between community support, which is something that a lot of organizations that are led by trans and sex rainbow people are providing community support to community members. That's extremely valuable. We are also organizations that hold community expertise and that's different to uh, the clinical versus consumer kind of binary, which really positions us not as part of an organization, not as someone with expertise, but as someone who just has had an experience as a consumer and maybe wants to give feedback, which is again, extremely valuable, but a different kind of expertise, a different kind of position to be in. Lots of points here about, about that. Also, <laughs> when you're thinking about why people are struggling, and this relates back to the informed consent model, which says that it's not helpful to require a mental health assessment as part of a pathway when there isn't ongoing mental health support available also as part of that pathway. And instead, maybe there are community organizations that are quite well positioned to be offering that kind of mental health support. It, I really think those community organizations help us depathologize the healthcare system. They help us locate the problem where it actually is. It's in the environment, it's in the context, it's in the system. Um, that's not inside that person in front of you. That's an oversimplification. Obviously, we do take things on and internalize things and um, minority stress is very, very real in that sense. But you get what I'm trying to say. The problem is not inside me. <laughs> And similarly, if you're a healthcare worker, the problem is not inside you. You are not the reason the healthcare system isn't meeting my needs in and of, it, in and of yourself. You, you are working within a wider system. And if we can change that system and improve it, even in small ways over time, it will have a huge positive influence for the providers as well as the consumers of that healthcare system. I think we all need to be working together. I think we're stronger when we work together. And I think it's challenging to work together when we all have really different sort of paradigms of knowledge or overlapping areas of expertise. And there's an expectation in the medical system that we will be part of a hierarchy. And that usually wants to position um, the more specialist, more medicalized knowledge at the top of that hierarchy <laughs> in, a, in a, you know, pyramid downwards to community support and community expertise being at the bottom. And I'm encouraging us to, to really reframe that and think about it much more as um, maybe as a circle, <laughs> just off the top of my head of a shape, but thinking about how we all have a role to play, right? And actually improving the healthcare system requires us to recognize each other's areas of expertise. So it is possible for me as not a clinician to recognize clinical expertise. It is possible for clinicians as not community advocates to recognize community expertise, but we don't have as many ways of languaging that. So I'm interested in moving that conversation forward today and, and ongoingly. This relates to public health um, and Moira, has influenced my thinking on this particularly too with their master's work. Um, there, we have a lot of research, we have a lot of data, counting ourselves is a really key example of that. We can use that evidence and data to talk about social determinants of health and impacts of things like transphobia on trans people's lives and the health inequities that we are facing. That really brings all of us together. You know, that's something that um, addressing the public health needs of transgender people across the world, that's a big call. I'm only really arguing for these islands, but, but that bringing together advocacy, social justice, human rights, there's a role for all of us to play in those um, partnerships. 
And we've also linked to that article that I've pulled that quote from, which has another quote on the next slide, which is about how we need a comprehensive approach that includes gender affirmation as a public health framework. And doing this needs to be informed by high quality data. Access to healthcare needs to be informed by high quality data. We have that here. And effective partnerships with local transgender communities. That's community expertise. So I'm not the only person by any means who's pulling this together. There are a lot of people who've done a lot of work on this kind of framework and the public health framework being extremely relevant. I just wanna put it out there as a way we could be working together. I think this is the last slide and I'm trying to summarize that the problem <laughs> is transphobia. And that is a problem for people working in the healthcare system as much, maybe not as much, but you know, similarly, it is a problem for people working in the system as it is for us trying to access healthcare. And I'm saying transphobia, but I really mean in combination with racism, ableism, homophobia, biphobia, et cetera, um, all of those isms, if you can recognize the expertise of trans and community led organizations and work with us and support our co-papa and we can work with you to improve that access, um, I really think that's gonna benefit everybody. You know, locate the problem in the system, not the worker, locate the problem in the environment, not the person and find ways to collaborate across disciplines and sectors. That's my really quick overview of how I think we could use a public health framework to, to work together. Haven't done a deep dive, but I'm very here for it. And if anyone wants to reach out to us after this webinar and talk more about how we're going to do that, I would love to hear about it. Those are some resources. <laughs> Sorry for the slight awkwardness with slide changing. Um, no, no. <laughs> just trying to, trying to guess when it's, when it was time. Um, time to shift things on. Yeah, and I think um, really here for any analysis about transphobia as a social determinant of health, all of that kind of thing. Um, and I was thinking too, it's probably important to kind of acknowledge um, the context that we're working in, in terms of mm. transphobia and That's right. trans health. Um, and that transphobia, you know, not only impacts directly on health outcomes, not only kind of impacts directly on trans people and um, our mental health, but um, is impacting on the healthcare system as well, that there's sort of organised movements, particularly overseas in the States and the UK, around actually people challenging the legitimacy of trans people and trans healthcare. So just acknowledging that we're working in that context and that that can kind of make these conversations difficult at times as well. Thanks, Joey. That was great. Um, lots in there. So much, so much. <laughs> Such a big ask to try and cover trans health in an hour, hey. Mm. Um, but you did a great job and we've had some questions come through. Um, I guess, um, uh, yeah, and feel free to, to keep asking questions in the, the Q&A or the chat as we're talking as well. Um, one of them was around um, the idea of informed consent and person sort of expressing concern around mm. what does that regret. mean about regret? Yeah, how do we remove the barriers of needing mm. to be diagnosed with something? Mm. The idea mm. of diagnosing people as trans or as mm. Mm. disorder of some kind. Um, how do we make sure that that we are um, supporting people to make decisions they, they won't regret? Yeah, well, we'll definitely link to some research that shows the extremely low incidence of regret in relation to gender affirming care. Of course, there are individuals in any context who will change their minds and say, okay, that wasn't right. Maybe I regret it, or maybe I've just changed my mind. And I'm not, <laughs> not in any way trying to say those people wouldn't exist or have valuable feedback to offer. But on a, on a broader picture, in terms of what kind of uh, rates of regret people have about surgeries or hormone treatments, gender affirming care is extremely low in terms of regret rates. And we'll link to that research. And in fact, it's directly linked in the opposite direction that access to gender affirming care is a protective factor against all kinds of mental distress, right? And vulnerabilities in that kind of area. So it's, and it's not even that 
transitioning and you know whatever it might mean there's a kind of idea that it's a one-way thing and that you start and then you stop right that you've finished or completed transition or gender affirmation and even if and I don't think that's accurate but we're not even talking about people getting to that end point and then feeling good about it we're talking about as soon as somebody feels that they have access to something and that there is a pathway and a possibility that is protective for their mental health and we have really a need to do some pretty intense suicide prevention work for trans and non-binary people in New Zealand. That is a higher priority than worrying about the extremely low incidence of regret that people experience. But we will, again, link to that research because it's not just, I don't want you to take my word for it. Mm -hmm. But I also would want to say that a mental health assessment doesn't necessarily provide the mechanism through which someone is going to realize or think about what they uh, what they might later change their mind about. It's not an automatic safety mechanism the way that some people think it is. I'm not against there being a very good conversation with someone about their hopes, dreams, wants, the, the things they feel worried about, the things they're looking for, the things they don't want to have happen. But all of that can be done without it being a hoop that people have to jump through because as soon as you make it a hoop that people have to jump through you're risking us being less honest with you because you've automatically made it that we have to pass the assessment you know if you've made a system where we have to um, demonstrate something to you in order to get access rather than it being a more honest and transparent conversation you're not getting the information that we might otherwise share mm -hmm. that's off the top of my head no, absolutely. And I think um, another part of that question was around how do we support people to be making these decisions? And I think um, having access to counselling or mental health support or peer support or just somebody so who important. you can talk to is so important. And, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody who's wanting to access healthcare had someone they could talk to who had nothing to do with providing that healthcare? Right. Completely separate person. Maybe they're a health professional, but they work somewhere completely different in a different service, and yeah. they could actually have an honest and open conversation with them about what they do want and what the options might be, and like yeah. what their worries and concerns are. Because if you um, if you are providing mental health support through an assessment type mm. model, um, it's not really a space where some someone's going to share any. Um, no, it's not the same concerns. reflection process. Mm, and it's not necessarily like it's hard to make that safe for somebody to express that they might not yep. be sure or yeah might yep. want things to go slightly differently so Absolutely. hopefully that yeah hope that addressed and I've met question. I've met a lot mm. of people who are in that position of providing those mental health assessments um, as psychologists or counsellors or, or psychiatrists and they know about this dynamic and they're trying as much as possible to make it a safe place where people can share and I applaud their efforts to be open-minded about what people might be bringing but it's not as much as you change your individual practice that's not going to remove the power dynamic about this being a point of access issue right it's not going to make you not be the point at which we have to get through something to get the access that we need if there was like Moira says somewhere you can have a conversation with someone who's not the person who opens the gate for you or not you're much more likely to reflect on what you are worried about and then you could bring that back to the person who is your access point if it felt like it was relevant and useful you know mm. I think I think we've got to get outside of the idea that the pathway of gender affirming care is itself the thing that is going to meet everyone's needs because mm. a those pathways are inadequate anyway and severely under resourced and there isn't enough access like people are on huge long waiting lists for all kinds of things but b that's like all your eggs in one basket doesn't make sense for the power dynamics of how the healthcare system works we need to have that community support more broadly we need to have lots of different ways we can be meeting our health needs mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes too the concerns about regret can be a bit um, out of proportion when you think about other types of healthcare people might access. So yeah. when we talk about informed consent, the idea is that you would go to a doctor, you, you know, you'd talk through your options, you talk through what you might want to access, and then you'd be given all the information and you'd weigh up the pros and cons, think about the risks, and then make the decision. And um, then there may or may not be some different ways that you feel about it a year down the track but you know that's that's the case with any healthcare that you might access um and we don't have kind of a special a special model of requiring mental health assessments for for most forms of healthcare that that do have higher rates of regret yeah 
yeah, it's that self-reflection stuff, trying to figure out how to, when is something a social stress? Because I think we're in a context where it's not surprising to me at all that healthcare workers would feel like they were taking a risk by supporting trans people to get access to the healthcare that they need, whether that's gender affirming care in particular, that is an area of stress for a lot of providers, or whether it's just being trans inclusive as a healthcare provider in a lot of different ways. I think the context we're in where there's increasing harassment and discrimination and organized campaigns against trans health and us having access to the care that we need makes it really hard for our providers as well as mm. for us. So I just want you to give yourself a chance to reflect on what that's like and the, the difficulty that you're facing in that and then to join PATHA and connect with other healthcare providers and talk to us at Tengako Kahukura about how we can be supporting each other and have each other's backs as we do this work because that's that's the that's the way forward that I think actually supports all of us, the people who are providing services and using services and helping to design services and giving feedback on services and all of that stuff that's to do with health. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, I don't think yeah. the way forward is to get stricter and more rigid about our pathways. I think the way forward is to um, make a more flexible system. Thank you. Um, I wondered if we could talk a bit about uh, practice and how doctors could be supporting people in the context of just the huge number of gaps there are in provision of care. Um, one of the questions that's come up is from somebody who's talking about their own um, treatment pathways and wanting mm. to access the service that they're really having a lot of trouble with. There's a really long waiting list. Um, we know with um, surgery services in particular, there can be extremely long waiting lists or in some regions things just aren't available or it's mm. not clear or you have to kind of put your name on a lottery and two people get chosen a year and you just don't really know how long you might need to wait um uh, yeah I wonder what healthcare providers can do in that space in terms of supporting people who are in their care but need somebody else's care who's not available it's a hard one. It's so hard. <laughs> there's no, yeah, there's not an easy answer to that. No, I, I do think we talked about the need for being transparent about that. And I would maybe add to it, don't give up. Like, just because something seems like it doesn't exist or um, there isn't a way to see a clear pathway. Um, as a healthcare provider, if you can advocate for better pathways and advocate for clearer access uh, for trans and non-binary people, for people trying to access gender affirming care. That I think that is what we're asking you to do to solve that problem. And it's not gonna get solved quickly. So I also recognize that you are being tasked with being in quite a difficult position where you have to sit with, sit alongside with someone who is probably quite stressed out and miserable about the fact that there is no pathway or there is a huge waiting list or there is, you know, a, a possibility that if they had thousands and thousands of dollars, they could go through a private process, but they don't have that kind of money. So, you know, that's being with us in that stress and not pretending that that stress isn't real is another big part of it. So I feel like there's at least two pieces there. One is the advocacy part that we're asking you to do to like learn about the pathways, improve the pathways, work with us, work with the community organizations that are listed on our website to join advisory groups, to you know write guidelines. We've got healthcare providers doing this work. You can find them as well. If you're not connected up, you can find them. And that, that kind of advocacy will long-term help address the issue and in the short term, be real about the problems with us. We're not, we're not going to think that they're your fault. We're going to understand that you are taking it seriously and taking seriously the negative effect that that has on us. Mm. 
So if we need some extra mental health support rather than an assessment to access something, but actual support because that's a stressful position to be in, is there a peer support group in your area? Is there a community access point that you could find with this person? Or is there low cost counseling that would be trans competent counseling from an organization like Outline? You know, that's nationally available counseling online. There's, there are yeah, ways you could help us with that stress. And it partly looks like trying to solve the long-term problem, but also I just think looks like being real about that and, and not glossing over it and not making that feel like our problem. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, and in terms of supporting that individual, I think it's, um, as you say, figuring out options around supporting people in terms of mental health and psychosocial support and not in a pathologizing way, like that's not mm. a, it's not a problem that people, like that's a really reasonable thing for people to be distressed about if they can't yeah. access healthcare, they need to get on with their lives, but it, it is something that can contribute to, you know, depression and anxiety and just having a really hard time. So I think being um, real and empathetic about that as well is really mm. important. We've had a couple of questions around kind of pathways for, for treatment. And I guess um, just to take that up a level, maybe the question is sort of how, how can doctors find out um, mm. what's available or support people to find out what's available. And I guess just naming that that's another um, yeah. difficulty in this mm. space is the sometimes lack of available good public information. current information. Mm. Yes, we will provide some links. I think the GMA, Gender Minorities Aotearoa website has some links to some pathways. Um, and we are interested to see what Te Whatu Order comes up with for national pathways, because previously it has been very regional and very, um, depending on which DHB you're in, there would be a different pathway or um, different pathways for different primary care providers in different places as well. Because that connection between primary care and uh, more, more secondary services is so important for gender affirming care in particular. Some things can really happen in primary care without the secondary care element. We're encouraging that more and more because that's, that's ac an access issue, right? You can usually get better access, more timely access to a GP or to a primary care clinic of some kind easier than you can get a specialist appointment, especially if it's about bouncing around, say getting a referral to an endocrinologist and then they require you to get a mental health assessment. You're waiting six months for the endo, six months for the mental health assessment, six months to go back to the endo. And you know, like that, and then they're just gonna refer you back to the primary care provider as well. So actually there are guidelines that would support the primary care providers doing all of that in, in most cases, not in all cases, but. <sighs> You can see yeah. that's one of the things that I want to keep returning to. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just another part of this whole topic where, where there sort of aren't necessarily easy answers, but we're hoping that the, yeah, that the health system reforms are an opportunity to improve things right. and to help build consistency across the country as well, hey? Yeah. Um, I feel like that might be a reasonable time to wrap up. We've got a couple more slides to share. We do. Um, just with a bit more information. So I might... Um, share my screen again and hand back to you, Joey, to nice. talk to those. And I also know that Jono has just put in the chat um, a reminder that we have a suggest a webinar box on our website. So not only do we hope that you will register for next week's extremely relevant webinar, remember I talked about organ inventories and software limitations, we have a guest speaker, um, Cassie is going to be coming to talk about workarounds, think what we can do um, in, in quite practical terms, what we can do as healthcare providers and clinicians to address the limitations of patient management software. Please register and join us. Yeah, and keep in touch, please. We, we would love to know what you want to know. We are running these publicly available webinars and we can invite all kinds of guest speakers if we don't have the expertise. Um, we're interested in knowing what you would like to hear about. So please go to the suggestions box and um, whether it's a topic or just a question, any of that, we wanna try and figure out ways that we can keep the dialogue going, keep the conversation happening and not just kind of throw a one hour recording out there and then disappear again. Like, we are here, we are doing the work, we are keen to work with you. 
and we are by no means the only community organization that is keen to work with you. So please get in touch and uh, talk to us about what you're trying to achieve and we'll see who we can connect you up with or how we can increase the relationships that we all have to try and do more advocacy in the healthcare space. And thanks to everyone who's saying thanks in the chat. And it's it's been great to see the excellent conversation that's happening in there. And there are some questions that we might follow up with afterwards as well. So just noting that. Anything you wanted to add about upcoming webinars, Moira? Uh, more so previous webinars, actually. I was just oh, yeah. looking at this picture and remembering, you know, we've got a um, directory of webinars we've done previously on our website. So there was a series last year that we worked on with um, gender minorities, Aotearoa and Patha and counting ourselves around mm. um, trans health and primary care in particular. And there's some good content there if um, you or anyone you know is interested in, but especially thinking about um, providing gender affirming hormones in mm. primary care. Um, there's some good conversations in that series. Webinars about pronouns, about <laughs> Suicide prevention, but supporting, extremely relevant topics. Yeah, supporting rainbow young people in rural communities. There's a whole range of, of webinars up there, and they're all kind of free and available for you to you to watch if any of those are of interest. Yeah, and I would like to acknowledge um, the Council of Medical Colleges again for collaborating with us on this webinar series that we've been running with Intersex Aotearoa. Um, Jelly, it's so wonderful to have you involved in any project we're involved with. Intersex Aotearoa is such an important organization and you do such important work. And we've been supported by the Tyndall Foundation with some funding to enable these webinars to happen. So thank you to um, the Tyndall Foundation as well. Kia Is that us? I think that's then, us. Yeah. And, and thank you for the compliments in the chat. It's wonderful to feel like we get a chance to share our thoughts and questions rather than just answers. I do feel like this is part of an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people who've shown up today are going to be part of that moving forward. So kia ora. Mm, kia ora. And thanks for the compliments. And if you're interested to provide a bit more feedback about um, what you mm. found useful about today's session or any ideas you have about future ones, we'll um, flick you through a evaluation form tomorrow. Um, so if you've got a few minutes to fill that out, that would be really wonderful. It would help us um, understand how to make these sessions more useful for you. Absolutely. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise just thank you so much for your time and attention and for turning up, being interested in this kaupapa and um, yeah, hope to keep in touch with you moving forward and Shall I close our session with a karikia, Joey? I think that would be wonderful. Yeah, especially we always open and close with karakia, but it feels particularly relevant to close up a session that has touched on such a lot of different points and asked some hard questions as well as offered some tips. This is a this is a, such an important kaupapa and there's such a lot of um, international and national strife going on in relation to trans rights at the moment. And we need you more than ever. So thank you for being here with us. And I hope that you have uh, gentleness in the rest of your day. Thanks, Moira. Kia ora. Thanks, Joey. Thanks again, everybody else. And me karakia tato. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapunui, kia wātia, kia māma, te ngākau te tīnana, te wairua i te ara takata. Koe ara e rongo whakaere aki ki ronga, kia tīna, tīna. Huie, taikie. Kia ora, thanks everyone.